Ella, what we like to do in the podcast is we ask our guests to look straight down the camera and describe themselves in 30 seconds. It's a really hard task and it's uh, embarrassing and it's awkward. Yeah, it feels It's actually already. quite mean. I'm yeah, starting to think it's mean, quite mean. And we love it. So if you can do that down the camera and your time starts now. How do I know when the time finishes? Well, it's going, it's ticking. I, you'll feel it. <laughs> you'll feel, you'll it. feel it. You'll okay. feel it. Oh, it's ticking. Hi, I'm Ella Mills. Nice to meet you. I'm the founder of Deliciously Ella, which is a plant-based health and well-being brand. I started it 10 years ago now after I was very, very ill, got to a very dark place in my life and I wanted to turn my life around and was one of those founders where I solved my own problem and then realized I could solve hopefully the same problem for a lot of other people. And I've been doing that ever since. Well, rambling. How is that? <laughs> that, was, that was great. That was Anna, good. Welcome, to, like 10. welcome to the podcast. That Thank was amazing. Um, hey, I, I'm, I, I'm super excited to, for you to be on this podcast because finally I can chat business with someone. And I feel like this is just going to be FMCG <laughs> chat the whole way through. <laughs> yeah. I know it is. Do you know I what? predicted this earlier. FMCG, fast moving consumer goods. I used to throw that out when I was started to be, when I first started Candy Kittens, I threw that out everywhere. I thought, and I used to throw the word out entrepreneur all the time. I thought I was some sexy, cool you still, dude. You still no, I don't. Sexy. I, really, I don't think I'm sexy at all. Um, do you look at your brand, Deliciously Ella, um, and feel really proud of it, of what you've achieved and what you've done? Such an interesting question. Sometimes, um, and I'm sure you'll relate to this, and I think most people can, which is that I think sometimes you get so caught up in the busyness, and I'm sure it's very similar for you guys at Candy Kittens. It does feel like you're continuously solving a problem, and it's like a never-ending firefighting exercise in some ways, I think, owning a business. There's a kind of 24-7 relentlessness of it, which means I think sometimes it's quite hard to take a step back and appreciate the journey. Mm -hmm. um if we're going to call it that and so it's quite hard i think sometimes to realize how far you've taken it and what you've done because you're so busy looking at the next problem and trying to solve it but you do have moments where you're talking about the brand and the company and what we've built up and you feel incredibly proud and i think for me it's this sense of community you know you get messages from people and they'll say you know this really changed my life and that for me that's the proudest thing by a million miles yeah, because your intro was amazing because you literally changed your own life, which is insane. And actually, I don't think a lot of people know this. And I, and I kind of want you to bring us back to that moment. You were really not well and you had chronic fatigue and you had dizziness and you had loads of different things going on. And this was during university. So take us back to that. What happened? How you were feeling? All of that. Yeah, exactly. So it was 11 years ago now and it really happened out of nowhere as a student. I just finished my second year at St. Andrews, loving it and really enjoying my life. And I out of nowhere got very, very ill. I woke up one morning and something wasn't right. And over the, every day it got worse and worse and worse. And I spent the next sort of three to six months in that hospital. I saw neurologists and endocrinologists and gastroenterologists and so on and so forth and was told I might have this disease or this disease or this disease and kind of you name it they tested for it and I had MRIs and ultrasounds and endoscopies I woke up in hospital to post a note saying nil by mouth you know because you've got to have this test and this test and mm. all the What's rest nil of it. by mouth means no Can't water eat. no food nothing and it's because I was so out of it it's a note being like no one feed her basically I mean it's what it's, <laughs> I mean it's, it's, it, in re I was so unwell and I was so kind of founding it so difficult mentally I think I kind of checked out that I look back on things like that mm. now and I'm like god I don't know why I didn't find that more kind of anxiety inducing but I think I was so kind of dejected that I almost didn't notice mm. and I was then diagnosed with a condition which is called postural tachycardia syndrome and it affects your autonomic nervous system so right. couldn't control my heart rate digestion circulation I had chronic fatigue I had chronic pain the easiest thing to liken it to is kind of extreme long COVID. It's the first time that I've had something that I think people can start to get in their minds what it could be like. But I literally could barely leave the house. I could barely get out of bed. Mm. Um, is the kind of crippling exhaustion was almost the worst part. But then every time you stood up, my heart rate would be 180, 190, and you, you oh lose God. your vision or you think you're going to black out or you do black out. 
So I was 21 and I was on steroids. I was on beta blockers. I was on antacids. I was on all kinds of medications. Mm -hmm. um, and I tried absolutely everything I could try. And they're all repurposed. They work really well for some people. They don't work very well for other people. So it wasn't guaranteed, but I just assumed it would work. You know, it's like getting tonsillitis, you get antibiotics, mm. you just kind of feel like it's a shoe. And shoo you believe the doctors, you believe everyone, they, yeah. it's going to work. Yeah. You just do what you're what, told. What causes it? They don't really know. Don't know. Um, it can be a kind of virus, sometimes a virus you don't even know about. So I tested positive for glandular fever, but I didn't have any symptoms of it. So right. it could have been just a subclinical virus like that, which mm. for some reason creates this weird cascade but they didn't know. So is it, is it like the immune system kind of just like going mad almost and yeah, like causing it's, havoc? It's, it's basically the all the systems that should self-regulate get out of whack. And then as soon as one gets out, it's effectively it felt like a kind of very negative spiral. Um, each thing felt like it made the next thing a little bit worse. And then lots of the drugs had quite a lot of side effects that then made other things worse. So I then got these chronic infections. I spent three and a half years in antibiotics. You still oh, have to go and toss for antibiotic drips. I mean, it was- This it, is miserable. It was, it was so miserable. And I think it was so much more miserable than I realized as well, because again, I just checked out. I kind of couldn't fathom how to talk to people about it because you know, you're in your early twenties. I was going to say, it's also a time in your life when you're supposed to be like out, having the having best the time best, ever. Yeah. Exactly. And so I think, you know, I was literally just at home with my mum. I watched so much, you know, the Kardashians a hundred times over <laughs> refresh Facebook more times than anyone ever could. And so, yeah, you're living this kind of quite depressing and very tiny life. And mm. as you said, all your friends are traveling and they're going out. And so I found it, yeah, really difficult to relate to people and talk to people about it. And I became very embarrassed and very kind of um withdrawn from everybody else around me because i just felt that everyone would look at me like i was very alien why does that happen always in situations always shame and embarrassment and i don't know why it's so funny you know people typically with with health problems whether it's mental or physical whatever it is we always feel embarrassed why, why, why did you feel embarrassed? I know it's such a good question. I think it's such an important question as well, because as you said, it's incredibly common when yeah. you're going through something difficult, as you said, whether that's mental or physical. And I don't know what it is. I think it was that, I think it was that I felt that I was just different to everybody else. And in reality, I wasn't. I mean, yes, it was maybe more extreme, but you know, so many of us go through mental, physical challenges with our health it it's probably more relatable than you think but i think it's that sense isn't it we're not necessarily all great at being really vulnerable all the time and being honest you know if i said to you say like how are you you'd probably say yeah i'm really good now obviously we we'd only known each other like 15 minutes so it might be weird if you told me your whole life story i, I mean it terrible. wouldn't i'd love he it was about yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, i was you know, yeah but we don't I do feel terrible <laughs> but do you know what i mean we don't really do that no, you, do, really. Like, I, I you know what if i'm having such a bad day like this has happened or this has happened or i'm feeling this or i'm feeling that and we're just not great at doing it it's so accepting that weakness isn't it and, exactly. and letting other people see it and which how we normal find it so is. terrifying to do exactly so i think that's what it is is that i think i had this sense of feeling other and so i just thought well, I just won't talk to people because if I just don't talk to them, they can't judge me. Uh, and that's dangerous, right? Because then what happens, you, you, you sort of become a recluse and then that's a sort of self um, fulfilling prophecy. So then it just gets it's cyclical. It just gets worse and worse mm. and worse. So then you almost just reject everyone because yeah. you, you, you can't go out and face anyone because it's become too much. Exactly. And you kind of then like, I almost felt like I'd lost the ability to have like normal just, conversations with yeah. people. Social. I mean, you did lockdown before it was cool. You did yeah, exactly. back in the day. <laughs> I know. I spent When it came around, you were some like, I got this. So. <laughs> yeah, I know, literally, I know how to do <laughs> yeah. this. I'm really Get the Kardashians on, get my Facebook up. <laughs> we yeah. are ready to rumble, people. <laughs> exactly. That is really tough. I didn't realize it was that extreme. I, you know, because you read articles about you and you, you see, I've seen interviews of yours and I, as I said, been a fan of the brand, so I, I, I know a bit about you, but I didn't realize it was that extreme. And at such a vulnerable age of 21, God, when I was 21, I had no clue who I was and I was so insecure and I was so wide eyed, doe eyed, whatever it is, just following everything and I wanted to fit in, be cool, uh, or go on the right holidays. And you can't do any of that. What does that do to your mental state at the time? Yeah, I think it's, um, my self-esteem was just kind of rock bottom. And it's really interesting, actually, I always say, I think it took me a lot longer to get better mentally than it did physically. You know, physically, after mm. a few years, I came off the medication, my health was relatively stable. 
but it's taken me such a long time. And I always think it's probably a little bit of it lingering actually of feeling normal again. Mm. I mean, what, what even is normal? You know, we'd all define it as something different anyway. And it's quite a fluid concept, but I do, I think I've, I've noticed there's a little bit of it that stays with me of like, oh, will I fit in? What will people think? But we don't talk about it, do we? No, of course not. It's so normal. You might go to a party or a birthday or a wedding or something and you maybe don't know that many people. But other people will be there too, being like, oh my gosh, I'm a loner. You know, what do I do? Who do I talk to? But we never say it. I've now do this new thing where I do say it, weirdly. So I... I, I, I just just break the ice. Yeah, I do. I think it does break the ice. It I, does. Yeah, 100%. I had this thing for so long. I've spoken to loads in the podcast. I had a panic attack, I had anxiety, all these different things. And I just never told anyone that I was feeling this way. And, and uh, you know, mine wasn't sort of... Um, health issues in terms of physical health issues like yours was mine was very much the sort of anxiety that i was dealing with but i never spoke about it to anyone ever ever I just denied it all the time and and you know I, i've learned to live got better with it all that different stuff um but my thing now is is if, if i feel a bit like tired or uh socially awkward or whatever it is which is kind of rare sometimes but i say it now I, i'll go for dinner with him or whoever or friends when i go i just feel god guys i feel like i'm not on the best form tonight and i feel like that always kind of breaks the ice because then typically people go yeah i feel the same i feel the same and i feel like more we talk about it the better oh yeah 100 percent. yeah it's just so much better that way the interesting thing though is that you then come out, out of that situation and you then as you're saying you were given all this medication all this advice and it's kind of working but not really but then you sort of move towards your diet isn't that right yeah exactly so as you said it, it was kind of working but probably made me like five or ten percent better and then came with a whole host of other side effects so probably ended up netted out about zero which meant <laughs> perfect being at home with my mum forever and I love my mum so much but you know it was the thought of that honestly was one of the things that made me want to change because I was like my future felt murky <laughs> and um and I started I've been googling and I started coming across all these people all over the world they had all sorts of different issues and they were loads of them were using their diet and their lifestyle. And it was having such a profound impact on the way that they were living and the way they felt. And I just felt, well, you know what? I've got literally nothing to lose at this point. If it worked for them, maybe it would work for me. Mm. But I literally, and obviously this is big, great news to you, all I liked to eat was sweets. That mm. was it. Delicious. <laughs> Delicious, <laughs> exactly. Delicious. <laughs> I mean, I just really didn't, I really didn't enjoy cooking. I had no interest in it. Um, and so I announced to my mum the next morning, I was like, right, I'm going plant-based. Um, I'm going to start a website teaching myself to cook. And I could see her reaction and other people's reaction. It wasn't that they weren't trying to be supportive, but they were a little bit surprised mm. as someone that didn't like vegetables, that couldn't cook, had no interest in cooking, being like, I'm going to start a recipe website. I mean, it's a bit ironic, isn't mm. it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. But did you have a history though of um, being quite opinionated and dominant? Because to suddenly change your whole diet and go, right, I'm going to do this. Were you always kind of like that? Yeah, I think so. And I've always been someone that's just... I really like autonomy and I really like making my own decisions. And I really have always struggled with doing what other people want me to do. Wow, that's such juxtaposition because then when you were feeling so unwell, you were so trapped. And exactly. so therefore that's the worst thing for you to feel. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think it made it a lot worse is you're suddenly so reliant on other people. You know, my mum always says you should like come and pick me up even from nursery school and all the kids would be doing something and I'd be by myself in the corner. And not because I was being bullied. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing in the corner with a dunce hat? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Just making noises. Yeah, rah, rah, rah. exactly. Ostracized from one. Yeah. No, oh, she's at it again. <laughs> but I just always like, well, I don't want to play that game. You know, I want to do this, and I've always, always been like that. And I'm still very much like that today. And so I think for me, it was just seemed quite normal to to do to do my own thing and follow that route. And it didn't really occur to me to <laughs> kind of think differently about it. Mm. But I, I, I find that that's really unique. And actually, what, weirdly, what it takes, in my opinion, to become a founder and a business uh, owner, you have to kind of block out all the noise and actually follow your naivety a lot of the time. I, I say this, I say this, all, naivety is your biggest superpower. You love, I, you love naivety. I you <laughs> yeah, love it, it, when it's positive. When it is positive, I do 100%. And I think that um, 
this is so this is what you have to do in terms of if you have to go down you know setting up a business whatever it is you have to kind of be ruthless with your decisions and also just be naive to situations and go well i think this is going to be right for me you you google the plant-based start you go okay fine this is something that i'm going to go for you start doing it and then you haven't turned back since so what happens then next it so i mean it's slow it wasn't like a kind of miracle cure overnight by any means but within a few months, things were very different. By the end of the year, I was on less medication. And within three years, all medication gone. Haven't been on it ever since. So it did. It completely changed my life. But I think almost one of the biggest things is, you know, saying a minute ago, you've had this sense of feeling other, of feeling quite different from people. And by through Delicious Ciela, I inadvertently started creating this community. Other people started coming to the website and they were struggling with all sorts of different things. And suddenly there was this kind of shared interest in this sense of, connection with other people i mean they were complete strangers on the internet mm. but it felt it felt really amazing and i think it was also this sense of purpose because i was so lost and as you said as well it's a really i think the, the early your early 20s are actually a lot more difficult generally for they everybody suck. that people talk about they suck your early 20s suck yeah and i think there's this pressure it should be the best time of your life yeah but it's hard because you're trying mm. to figure out who you are and what you want to do and you feel like all your friends have got it figured out and i think all of that kind of came together where I did feel incredibly lost. I suddenly had this kind of clear sense of, right, this is changing my life. Can I help you? Can I help you? Can I ne- do that? Can I help the next person? Could th- th- this is what I want to do. And I felt really kind of called to it and really excited about it. And so I had this, I felt like I kind of had a wake up moment. That- it often seems the way like when people like out of desperation or when they're in like such a like fucked up situation that's when they kind of feel this urge to like go and help others. Well, I think you relate to that sense of like, I I would never, ever, ever want to go back to where I was. And this sense of if I could help one other person come out of that place, it would all feel quite worthwhile. Mm. And I think you, maybe it's that you need that, you know, when you're in the dark place, it's got to feel like there's a reason to be there. And maybe there's like a bigger purpose to it. What with, with you know, there's loads of different like data that supports this stuff. Like for example, um, when people are unwell and they're in hospital and they sit next to a window and they see nature, typically you you get healthier quicker, mm. right? And so a, a, a lot of kind of situational things, your environment, what you're doing, kind of make you feel better. Is there an argument to suggest that because you had changed your diet to plant based and you were on this sort of road to going oh my god i've changed something i'm doing something i'm in this could that have helped as well or do you fundamentally believe that no me changing my diet that was it that's what helped me oh no i think it's absolutely a combination of Mm. things i don't think there's any kind of one simple solution to it but i think definitely having that kind of a lot more mental clarity a sense of purpose a sense of excitement every day Un- undeniably i think that's got to have a big impact it's like a placebo almost as well because if you really believe exactly even, even if it's not doing anything no no that, to- that belief will like will do a lot i think do you know how strong placebo is as well like yeah, it's no, extraordinary it's, 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 it's extraordinary you know they've done like tests for example where um i know even with like things like uh i think like diabetes likes things where they they've sort of said that it's this will, you know, help you, you with your insulin or whatever. And your body actually truly believes that, that they seem like a spike in insulin and things like this. But there's an extraordinary study that was done during chemotherapy for breast cancer with, visu- with one um, group of people doing visualizations of, of the drugs working mm. and their results were infinitely better. What? It's actually yeah, so, it's, it's it's so really fascinating. Extraordinary. The mind is so powerful. It's like, like quantum Wait, physics. Wait, so, so explain that more. So people were, so people, explain that a little bit. They were given fake results? No, no, no. They weren't given fake results. They were, they were doing the same um, chemotherapy, the same drugs, but one group were given visualizations to listen to, to, and the, and really focus the mind on the fact that the drugs were working and exactly how they were healing the body. Mm. And the results were more beneficial the drug had bigger impacts on that cohort of people they did this test on like 25 people who were sort of clinically depressed um and what they did is they told them to start speaking positively to each other and so they, what they did, they spoke positively to each other. And they then got them to do different groups together where they were going to play tennis once a week. And by the end of something like six months, most of them were off the medication just because they were speaking nice. And even if they didn't feel it, they would force to do that to each other. And it's how the brain works. If you really sort of push yourself towards a sort of positive place, actually you can make yourself feel better. Um, so you're, you're setting up the blog, you're doing all of the website, you're writing these and you're, you're documenting kind of your journey with this 
um, with your situation. What happens next then? Do you then start thinking about, right, we want to expand this into a proper brand? No, that had honestly never crossed my mind. Um, had it not? Not not at this point. I mean, at this point, I was still living at home, my parents' kitchen, and my dad every day would say, when will Ella get a real job? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was still feeling, I was still kind of really figuring it out. And it wasn't until, so our first book came out at the beginning of 2015. And it was not, I don't say this in a self-deprecating way, it was not expected to be a success. You know, it would be great. We could sell it to the people that, that followed the brand online and on social media. But it wasn't, you know, they'd printed 20,000 copies and that was it. And we sold them before the book had come out. Oh my God. I've done a book and I know. <laughs> how, yeah, many, yeah. how many did you sell Not before Not anywhere near that. <laughs> yeah. Woo, <laughs> mine was a little bit less. <laughs> You're not helping save lives, Jay. That's why. Uh, well, listen, through humour. <laughs> I think you've probably ki- killed a few people. Oh, yeah, oh my God, mine uh, was not very popular, but <laughs> but that's okay. That is okay. Can't get everything right. God, exactly right. You there can't. You, you can't get everything right. And so you 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 sold twenty thousand copies. Yes, yeah, so we'd sold thirty two thousand before the book was published. So I mean, it was what that is which crazy. Is in book world, it's a lot, and so it was if you do ten thousand, you're you're like well done, applauded for that. Yeah. Right? So we had this kind of we. It was just this moment where. You, it's really interesting. I, I think I knew my life was changing. I was, um, it's really strange as well, because you know magazines, they never let you see an, an interview or an article before it's published. But for some reason, they'd done an interview in You Magazine. We, I had done an interview in You Magazine. For some reason, they let me see it about two weeks before it ran, mm. which is quite unusual. Yeah. And I was, I was with my ex-boyfriend at the time, and we'd been together four years. He's, great, he's a great guy, but I think we both had started to realize probably wasn't for the long term. <laughs> yeah. And we were at his sister's wedding in Germany and it just, again, it just had felt like a different culture. And I, we were, we'd had, we were away together for three days. I think we both just knew this was the end and mm. it was in a really nice and friendly and kind of amicable way, but it, I think it was quite clear. Look, you know, I'm done. I'm uh, not into this anymore. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel the same? Good. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. And it somehow works like that, which was quite extraordinary, but I was really, it was, it was the last night and he was living in America at the time and I was, Anyway, we were going our separate ways the next day and that felt, you could kind of feel something was shifting. And I got, mm. that night, I got this email through with the You Magazine interview and the title was The Ella Effect. And it talked, so it's the very beginning of 2015 and it talked all about kind of the story and what I was doing and this community that I formed. And I read it and I was like, I think this, you know, you, you it feel- felt good. It, mm. well, it just felt like something was going to change and that life was about to be really different. I think because you were sitting there and it was, you could see like personally and professionally, everything was about to change. And then that came out a few days later. We also broke up a few weeks later. So, so you're um, like, I feel different. I feel different. I, I feel like and much, I feel are, like are relief. You, are you feeling the Ella effect? Because <laughs> I am. <laughs> That's yeah. what we should call it. I might just do the Ella effect. <laughs> oh God, Has anyone so else so done loud. the... Ella effect where you break up and you feel a sense of change. (laughs) (laughs) And then the book was number one on Amazon. Wow. And God, there was some Daily Mail commenters, which, you know, you then learn, don't read those. Um, They're genius. The Daily Mail. Yeah, 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 your first first time? Your first time. Oh boy. It's a real jungle that you get in there. Just wasn't ready for it. (laughs) I mean, I don't know how you could be ready for it, but I was not ready for it. My first ever Daily Mail comment I ever read. It was the first, it it was the first, I was in the Daily Mail. I was like, I'm in the, I'm in the Daily Mail. I have freaking made it. This is the moment. And I went, who says don't read the comments? They're going to love me. And I read the first (laughs) one. First one was, saw this bloke walking up the King's Road. He really is a short, balding dwarf. (laughs) Oh, oh You're my like, god! Yep, nailed it! <laughs> yeah, killed yeah. it! Here we are, Start killed <laughs> it! And then, like, two blow was like, "Boy, this guy's ugly." I was like, "That's, that's like real. That's like that's not even that's not even creative." Like right, scrolling, <laughs> I can't be right. Hang on, let's get another one. Oh my god! Uh, it's, it's just it is, It's actually it's so brutal. Yeah. It why so why are people so mean? What's wrong with uh, and a girlfriend of mine was like, her best thing was to troll them back. So she created her account, like a fictional, which I think she was like Kathy from Leicester. And she would just go back at them all and, oh, it only made it so much worse. Anyway, I obviously subsequently learned not to look at them. But just suddenly it exploded. And I'd gone from this, you know, like literally just being in my parents' kitchen, nothing happening and very unsure about my life to suddenly 
being it felt like you were literally everywhere definitely mm. overexposed wow. and the story had been picked up by kind of every media outlet and you're suddenly on the radio or you're on this morning and you were doing this and you were doing I that remember, and people I were remember. talking about you not to you and it was just this kind of yeah i think it's i had like sensed something was going to change moment, but i didn't realize it would change like that it really did feel yeah. like that D did you have that sense where everything seemed to be going in the right direction that you were almost worried it was going to stop <sighs> kind of yes and no it felt i didn't know what the right direction was because i genuinely wasn't intending for that to happen like that wasn't the goal that wasn't the aim did, did you still feel like you had ownership of like what was happening or was it just like this like runaway ship it felt like, like a runaway ship so in a way it was like in a way it was kind of the wildest dreams coming true mm -hmm. which is this mission and this sort of like concept that you're really passionate about suddenly going to everybody but it did feel like the train had certainly left the station mm -hmm. it was kind of up in scotland you know it had gone so fast and i i think i was it was just really overwhelmed by it. And I mean, yeah, I was must. so young. I had How old are you at this point? 24? 23, 2024. 20, 20, oh yeah, God. I mean, I was an absolute baby. And I, I just, Shit. you know, you don't know what you don't know. So you said it's kind of great to go into it with naivety, but at the same time. Oh no, but that's tricky because when you're also, what's really hard, I can imagine, and maybe I'm putting words in your mouth. It's about health and all these different things. And you're only talking from your own experience. And then what happens is people come to you hoping for you to change their world. And you're like, hang on a second. I, I'm just... My idea, you know, this is my idea. I, it's it's suddenly going juggernaut and I'm too young to really understand how to can a little. Totally. And you're kind of pitched to something you're not. It was like, you know, the queen of healthy eating. I was like, yeah. I'm, I'm 23. Yeah. Like I just graduated from university. I'm learning to massage kale. I mean, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I literally felt I had got no idea what I was doing. Wow, that is scary because then also you're then... Uh, so fearful for whatever you put out or say because you're like, is this part? Is this on brand? Oh, is and it... I said so many wrong things. Of course things you as did. Well. Yeah, of course you. Did. And you just don't know what to do and what to say and how to be. And then you always have to be like, um, what is your deepest flaw? My deepest flaw is I work too hard. Like, it's like that kind of answer because you don't really know what to totally. do. And I'm sure you, you know you guys felt the same, which is that I think it's this strange moment where you, you do feel kind of quite out of body. And you are kind of figuring out, you know, do I want to continue with this? But at the same time, you just think, well, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. And you've, mm -hmm. you've I felt I'd be insane not to run after it yeah. because that, that would that was never, ever going to happen again. You know, you have those moments and you've got to capitalize on them. And it was this, even if it feels uncomfortable, you just get these crossroads in your life. Absolutely. And you've got... If you don't take advantage of it, it just, it will not happen again. I, 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 without a doubt, believe that's true. I was actually talking to uh, Sophie, my fiance, yesterday about that yesterday. She said everyone gets little pockets of moments and it's about realizing what moments they are and going and grabbing hold of them. And some people don't really fly with them. They kind of just let them fizzle out, but actually you're meant to really go with it. But it's tough though. We, I think mine and Mitt's thing was different though, because we, we didn't have the pressure of um, being kind of... Uh, you know, responsible for people's health and things like that. We could be naughty and say things and just uh, mm. walk out of nightclubs drunk or whatever it was. No one cared. Like, but with you, you had to hold a position and a presence and a persona of being someone who is healthy and this and that and clean and tidy and all those different things. And you're 23 years old. That's intense mm. to handle that. And I think that also, oh my God, I, I, and no one else has been through it all. So you then also can't, it's not when you say, oh God, um, I have a headache. What do I do? And they say, take a headache pill. You have no one to really turn to, to ask for advice. So you're just going through it. No, totally. And I think it was also, you'd already felt quite other, you know, and the stranger who's saying the last few years, because you felt you were quite different from all your peers. And then suddenly you feel even more different. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was kind of, it was just a, a really kind of strange mixed bags of mixed bag of emotions where in some ways it's extraordinary and you feel so lucky, but in other ways you feel very isolated and a little bit confused. Yeah. And I'm going to stop you there. This in a part one. I want to come back to part two. I want to talk about marriage. I want to talk about your brand and I want to talk about your new book. Okay. You ready for it? Yeah. Because boy, I am. Mitt, you ready for it? Oh boy. Oh, I, baby. I am in. Oh, the Ella effect. We'll <laughs> see you in part two. Bye-bye. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to part two of Private Parts. Still here with Ella. Um, the Ella effect. 
That's the new thing. It's going to be a new thing. Um, and how many books have you written? Six. Wow. It's a lot of books. It is a lot of books. Mm. Your, you have your new book out. Um, title is? How to Go Plant-Based. Is it your favourite? Um, do you know what? I've got two favourites, actually. Okay. Um, this one, because I think it is just the best. Like, I don't just say that. As in, I think you know you learn a huge amount don't you and you you realize all the things maybe weren't quite right in the past and I feel like this one is the accumulation of all my learnings and I think it's by far and away the best book in the way it's written and its usefulness and all the rest of it but our fourth book which was called the plant-based cookbook came that came out uh middle of 2019 and that one was a really it was quite a cathartic book actually because it was the first time I included a lot of the journey of creating the company in there and all the things you know so, social media is a strange place isn't it and it's a, such a snapshot but so much of it when people say oh it, it's not it's not authentic or people aren't telling their whole story I think a lot of the time it's because at whatever at that time for whatever reason you can't mm. you know it might be that whatever's affecting you is actually somebody else's story and it's not yours to talk about online or you know it's business challenges that you certainly cannot share in the moment because you can't let other people know you think you're going bust tomorrow mm. you know that wouldn't be brilliant for kind of supplier relationships etc <laughs> um and so it's the first time i wrote it all down wow and it was really 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 cathartic so i always hold a special place for that book that's amazing you know, with any business owner, you've always had to go through the highs and the lows. Um, I want to focus on the lows quickly. What lows have you had to deal with? God, there's just so many, isn't there? I know. I you know. said when, early on in the conversation, naivety is key to starting a business. And I, I so agree with that. I think it is with kind of any big life decision because it's sort of better that you don't know what you don't mm. know, although mm. you do need to recognize it. Um, well, you make decisions as well that you probably would never make if you were experienced in that situation, but actually can lead to positive sometimes as well. Exactly. But there have been so many. I mean, I think in the early days, it's just the classic, like everything's so scrapped together and it's all a bit of a mess and you genuinely don't know if you'll go out of business the next day. You know, I remember the first time we really had that was we knew we had a, um, a hole in our cash flow everything was being paid on one day and there were six weeks where we were in trouble and then it all came back in. We knew, and we knew that was coming and we, we'd we spoken to an investor who was, had been, we first opened a, a little cafe at the end of 2015. He was a, came in every single day. He lived right around the corner. He was a guy mm. that worked in finance and invested in lots of consumer businesses. And he was going to make, you know, a relatively small private investment and we'd agreed everything. And then he went really quiet and he went really quiet and he went really quiet and he went really quiet. And then the day before we were meant to sign this, just before we had this massive hole. Maybe he fell down the hole. Yes. <laughs> he obviously said, you know, I'm not going to sign it. I want to change oh, all the terms. Um, because obviously you've got, you know, and again, that's naivety, isn't it? We should never have left her. We should have walked away earlier. But mm. um, yeah, you just trust people. And we'd known him on a personal level. We saw him literally every day. And um, can, can I be really personal and feel free not to say, what investment were you looking at around that time? In what region? I can't. You know what? I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was say like 150,000 yeah. pounds. It wasn't, it wasn't on the grand scheme of things, an enormous Absolutely. company investment. It was, it was to really get us through this kind of challenging period. But he then changed all the terms and wanted an absolutely enormous amount of the business and, you know, blah, 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 in order to sign it. And it was, that was one of the most kind of difficult moments where A, you realize the reality of like the sharkiness mm. of the world and B, you think that you really are going to go bust before you've really got started. So basically. then what do you do? How do you, how do you change that straight away? Well, so we walked away, which was one of the hardest things we've ever done. Um, cause you don't actually know if you'll figure it out. Um, my mother-in-law, who was one of the most extraordinary women, she lent us her money, put some of the money she needed to pay her tax bill. That's like began, wow. which was really trusting because we were like, we will have it back in six weeks. And she, she trusted us on that friends and family, it was a real, like we tried to move loads of payment terms around. You know, we needed an extra two days here, an extra four mm. days there. We kind of took the gamble of not paying this, you know, this bill, wait a minute, et cetera. And we did manage to get through it and we paid my mother-in-law back in full. Um, in four weeks? No, in full, yeah, no, just after, just, yeah, eight weeks later. Wow. Cause we knew it was coming back, which is why this guy behaved so badly. So there were, that was, I think one of the biggest lessons you know, I, it's, 
you have the meeting of personal and professional, don't you? And I think that's one of the other big challenges. But also because with your brand and, and forgive my um, limited knowledge within that sort of space of it, but you, you, um, you, you have your your product that you yeah. sell, and then you have your. I love your balls, by the way. <laughs> there really, is <laughs> really lovely balls. <laughs> Get me energized. It's also just the positioning. I just think positioning of where it is is just fab. But you also had retail um, spaces as yeah, well. Yeah, so we've got one restaurant. Yeah, which is a, it. It's ended up being, and that was that. That was one of our other hardest moments. So when we first started, so my husband and I started work. We met just after, so many questions. So Go. many questions. So many questions. Trying Go. to fit it. Anyway, so yeah, we met. We started working together um and got engaged and everything all within four months i mean completely nuts really but all's well that ends well just quickly before we were you you meet you start working together yeah and then you get engaged within yeah four months it's the ella effect yeah the, it's the ella effect again that's it's reverse it's, it's a reverse it's reverse effect, yeah quickly um what were you thinking i was thinking two things how do you know it's your life partner first yeah. And secondly, working with your partner. How tricky is that? Yeah. It's really strange. I was always kind of quite on the fence. Do I want to get married? Do I not want to get married? That wasn't something that was particularly important to me. My parents had a very complicated marriage, not a very happy one. And it wasn't probably the best example. Yeah. Um, and so I was always about unsure if that's what I wanted in my life. And um and I was not looking for a partner in any shape or form. And we met um, through our parents. So it's a bit of an arranged marriage. Um, <laughs> his mom and my dad used to work together. And he read this article in uh, when the book came out. The, the Alara Effect. We yeah. knew it. There we go. We were right. <laughs> we were. Yeah. Mate, was, you were right. Oh, no. The article changed my life. It really did. And wow. um, and he was thought it was very interesting what I was doing. And so he'd met my dad through his mum and said, can you put me in touch? And my dad, who at the time I had a very difficult relationship with and I wasn't really talking too much, suddenly sent me all these messages saying, this is the most amazing man you'll meet in your life. Look how handsome he is taking image, like Google images. I mean, so creepy and weird. <laughs> and no, um, hang on, wait, you're saying, we've got, to give, we've got to give you a great match made by your dad is really weird. Because your, your wonderful husband obviously saw a picture of you and was like, she looks cute and she does the, this. This is the Ella effect. I want to meet her. This sounds amazing. That's just great. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was confident. Anyway, so we got together, but we didn't, it wasn't a date. He he was with someone else at the time and we were talking about what I was doing and he was really interested in it. And then we met again and I did leave that meeting a little bit confused about, it, it felt unprofessional, you know. Mm. <laughs> and um, and God, so, that kiss was really yeah, unprofessional. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Why did he yeah. kiss me? That was bit. <laughs> and um, anyway, so I was a bit confused, but um, anyway, he, he then asked me out. So we went out on the Thursday night Sunday and then the next Thursday we moved in together. Wow. Get out of oh here. Oh my god. Yeah, Full which on. is mad. I mean in retrospect like what did completely come on? mad. Was it electricity when you first meet first met? It was just this sense and it's so strange because as I said the only reason I caveat the fact that I wasn't sure I wanted to get married or anything was I feel I would the idea of kind of love at first sight yeah, so it just was nuts to me. Like I just couldn't get my head around that was just the polar opposite of who I was. But I met him and I left the first time I met him, I said to one of my best friends, I was like, that is the person that I would marry. And so I said, not sure I should see him again because I'm not sure I'm ready for that. <laughs> and um, that yeah, wild. it was really, it was this very strange sense of, of we'd grown up in these kind of very parallel lives. We'd grown up about 15 minutes away from each other, but he's eight years older than I am. So we we didn't know each other, but we you had but, so but many, many years that's always i always think that's pretty similar <laughs> yeah, yeah and had so many of the same friends and it just had such a similar life in so many different ways that i think it just felt like home wow so that happens you move in together you 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 get engaged and then you're starting your brand together yeah that, that is one of the biggest rules anyone always says right it's that classic line never go into business with friends or family but you do that straight away what yeah. is the positives and negatives of doing something like that so well, what I think we realized really quickly was I was quite, as I was saying earlier, really in over my head and quite overwhelmed as this was just as delicious yellow kind of exploded. And I think what, as, but equally, as I said, it was so clear there was an opportunity and this opportunity was not going to come around again. It was a now or never moment. And I think what was really clear to both of us was that that opportunity was there. 
that I don't think at the time I could have or wanted to capitalize on it on my own. Um, I don't think I could capitalize it on my own. And I think we, we needed each other. He mm. was working in finance, hated it, was bored out of his mind. And so for him, it was like, wait a second, there's this really exciting brand here. You could do so much more with it than you're doing. And that's what I wanted to do, but knew I couldn't do that on my own. I mean, mm. he would start to look at my numbers and just be like, oh God. Yeah, I didn't it's even not, look at numbers. Yeah, it's not my forte. <laughs> yeah, it's not my And forte. I didn't want, you know, I knew that I wasn't going to have a successful business if I was left in charge of anything like that. Um, well, you're the classic entrepreneur, maybe not the best businessman, but in the sense that happens to a lot of people where you're the creator, the designer, the understanding, the, it, the, the vision, all that kind of stuff. But actually, you know, the numbers and stuff like that behind the scenes, maybe not your forte so you need to find your yin to your yang exactly and i think that's why it works i would always say to people if you're very similar working together would be the worst idea you could disaster. ever have disaster because you've got to have autonomy you've got to say who's in charge of what because lots of decisions are relatively subjective at the end of the day and i think someone's got to have ownership and if you both feel you've got ownership of the same thing that's going to be really difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just doesn't work. No, whereas we are, we have exactly the same values. So we're very aligned, which makes it quite easy. It's incredibly rare that we disagree on any kind of bigger, more important decision. But on the day to day, I mean, we go into the office together and we go home together, but we probably three or four days a week actually basically don't speak to each other during yeah. the day because we're doing such fundamentally different things. So it's almost like we both enabled each other to have the careers that we quite wanted to have that we wouldn't have been able to have separately. God, that is luck. Mm. That is immense luck. I, is. I, there are so many times and situations where like, I have a, my business partner, Ed, um, he was a designer um, at Loughborough. Um, a guy I knew in Loughborough introduced me to him and we'd never met. And literally from that moment on, I said, well, let's do, do this together. And then that was 11 years ago. Yeah. yeah, it's it's strange how things like that, that kind of relationship sometimes just works. Exactly. And you, re I mean, I, I love having a, a partner in, in that sense is in to share the kind of stresses and intensity of it. I think doing it on your own would feel very lonely. Mm. But selling a product is hard. I, I it's, really for, hard. it's really hard from experience. And a lot of people have dreams and visions and ideas to do it. And, and uh, you know, we were speaking about this before. I, I, I don't have a pessimistic attitude towards things. I, th I, I love it when anyone sets up a brand. I think it's the most incredible thing. I just have a realistic approach to, to that. Um, and boy, it is tricky. Margins are tight. Um, it costs a lot of money to hold stock. You have to have staff that you pay for, all these different things. Um, have you had the same stresses and the same hardships and the same dealings with the retailers and different places? And, and where, where do you, I had so many questions there, but where do you focus most of your energy with the business? Is it towards selling and retailers? Is it direct consumer? What, what is it? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you and a hundred percent on the stresses. Absolutely. Um, I think there is this glamorization of starting a business, entrepreneurship, you know, female founders as well, you know, that kind of hashtag girl boss that's happening. And in a way, as you said, I, I, I love it and I respect it. And, you know, entrepreneurship is a really important part of our economy and it's, it is brilliant. But I do think the glamorization almost sets people up for, Absolutely. for failure because it's, it's so different from what you expect in mm. that sense. Like it is our whole life. Like we mm. have no life outside. We, we've got two children and between them and work, we have no life. Yeah. Like literally no life whatsoever. Bye to, bye bye to social life, anything like that. See ya. <laughs> yeah, gone. Um, you know, holidays. See ya. See ya. <laughs> bye. Yeah. It's so true, isn't it? Yeah. And I just think we don't, again, it's talking about things we don't talk about enough. I don't think people talk about that enough. So people, it's like, you know, they feel like, they're not succeeding because they've got this pipe dream. And my thing, people say, you know, what's your number one piece of advice? My number one piece of advice is, you know, are you ready to sacrifice everything else in your life? Because mm. if you're not, then don't, don't do it. It's not worth it. And if you are, because you feel so cool to it, then it's so, it is so worthwhile. Mm. And I think for me, the answer is, is yes. But I, I do think it's an important question. And also I, I kind of want to squash that sort of attitude as well and and forgive me if this is not true but i i assume what i had was when i started kind of getting and had that sort of somewhat success of it people said oh you're heir to mcvitties and you have all this money to do it we started with not we had three grand 
Air to me videos. I mean, I've never seen any of it that cash. I don't know. Like, I, I get that. I get. It's got a load of biscuits. Yeah, it's in your got house. Like, fucking get, useless. I get this. I get this. <laughs> your competitors. Yeah, 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 I know. We sold it in like the eighties. Like, I mean, the, the thing is, is that people would think that I have the um, idea that they think I'm a billionaire, and so I get the sort of negative connotation of being a billionaire, but none of the cash. So it's a really bad place to be in. <laughs> but I almost. Um, and then what happens is, is that you know, I, I did made in Chelsea, or whatever. There are massive negatives to doing that. Yeah, you get some marketing and things like that, but they don't matter if you're the king of England, right? Your product has to be good. It has to have longevity. It has to have all these different things. You know, you, your family is tied to Sainsbury's. And so, and you create this blog. And so people go, well, you had it easy. You create this product and you get into these retailers and you have this blog and this money to do that. Did you, do you get irritated and try and defend yourself sometimes about it? It used to drive me so nuts. Yeah, yeah. And I really, yeah, I never really knew how to respond to it or what to say. And I used to, yeah, I used to get quite upset about it because, you know, you're saying you're working so hard. It started with a blog that became cooking classes, that became supper clubs, that funded an app. The book then came out that did really well. That funded the cafe, that funded the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And, you know, we, we took on, you know, almost five million pounds of debt last year to buy out our shareholders. Like it's not mm. something where people are like, here you go, off you go, it's your wow. business. That's big. Yeah, a massive life decision. And what was the decision behind that? It was when we took the money on, we need we needed to raise investment. We were growing really fast. We needed support with cash flow. Um and um and it was the right decision in that sense. And they were nice guys, but they weren't adding to the business. There was nothing strategic about it. They, yeah, as I said, they weren't, they weren't really adding anything. And in five, five years after they invested, they could sell their shares. And so it was kind of like, well, do we wait a year and see who they decide to sell to, or do we preempt it, buy it back? Mm. And then it's our decision to make with what's next. It's, it's sorry. It's great advice that for anyone listening is that there is people don't realize that setting up a business, setting up a brand. Um, and when you look to raise capital, cause that's a, you know, money's oxygen it helps us breathe. Always, always be careful who you raise investment from, because firstly, once they have equity, you can never get it back. They always have it unless you, you know, take five million pounds, take of debt. five million pounds of debt <laughs> and never and, sleep and never sleep and have really good interest rates. <laughs> so, yeah. But, but the point is, is that everyone, Someone told me once that everyone has money in their pockets about finding a way of getting it from their pocket into your pocket. How do you do that? So look, there is money out there. And so pick and choose who your investors are. Don't jump at the first hurdle that gives you whatever, 10 grand, five grand, a hundred grand, a million quid or whatever it is. Oh, and hold on as long as you possibly can until you actually need it. Absolutely. Um, because otherwise you'll give away so much for nothing. Oh, well, I, I, guess, I guess you kind of proved when you had that hole. Like you were going to take on that money, but you actually exactly, and there was a way it. to scrape through. Whereas at this point, the business was growing so fast, and it was going in such a great direction. But it, we we just needed support with cash flow. We knew we did, and that was the that was the right decision. But we knew we felt it was the right decision it, to it, buy it back. But to your point, like we'd never there'd been literally zero handouts, and, and you know, same as you, you know, Sainsbury's went public, and my family have had nothing to do with the running of it at all. You know long before i was born when my yeah. mum was about 18 i think yeah this is, you know a long time ago so but there's and actually ironically they were one of the last retailers to stock us we've now got them that, <laughs> were that they really well. were yeah, they really the, they, one of the last yeah that I, is hilarious exactly so there's just this irony of being like yeah and it is hard to find it but i've thought a lot about it over the last few years and and obviously it's not that I don't acknowledge that obviously there's still, you know, privilege associated with it. But mm. I think what it actually gave me was this normalization of the impossible. You know, my grandpa and his brothers and their cousin were the last generation to be involved in it. And they really kind of built it into what it is today. And it's obviously one of the biggest brands in the country. And I, I used to be embarrassed about that because you said people make all these assumptions about you. And obviously, you know, they had done growing up as well. So I think you become, that comes kind of quite intrinsic in you as well. And, but I think I realized that actually there's so much to be proud of, but also they created this mindset of thinking like, okay, you know, it started as a grocery cart on Drury Lane and it became wow. this. Wow. And you just realize like- That history is insane. Right? And you realize it's possible, but it, it, I think in my subconscious, that was always possible. So when you're kind of starting to create a brand and doing things differently and everyone's getting a normal job and you're trying to turn a blog into X, Y, and Z, you're thinking, oh, I could do that. 
Oh, and we could sit and talk about so many different things. One of the things that I, I do want to know, and, and it, God, it is probably the hardest question to ask, but you know, if you have a business and a brand, typically a, a, a sort of FMCG product, as we said at the beginning, <laughs> that's cyclical. Um, the, how do you create a point of difference? What, how do you get that in front of retailers? How do you get it in front of I know, the, the corner shops? What do you do to really push your brand out there and get seen? I mean, we just did it really backwards, to be honest, which is that, and it was inadvertent completely. So, you know, I'd love to sit here and say we had this brilliant business plan, but in reality, it was an accident, to be honest, initially, which is that we created a brand before we created a product. Oh my God. I, I, so, I'm so sorry. It's exactly the same as we did. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's a really different approach. And it's not something, I think kind of pre the age of social media and the internet, that was that was a very difficult thing to do, such an impossible thing to do because to create a brand, you had to have extraordinary marketing budgets because you'd need to do, mm. you know, above the line campaigns, you need to get on buses and you need to get on the tube and you need to get on TV. And that's extraordinarily expensive. You know, that's not something we've got the budget to do even at this point. And so, but the, the world of social media has started giving people the opportunity to start to build brands. So we had accidentally spent several years creating a, ba a brand, creating a mission, creating a community. You know, when our food products first went into stores, we had over 500,000 people, you know, just on Instagram following what the brand was doing. So that in immediately creates a point of difference. But also we were kind of, you know, not, not on our own, but kind of there was this collection of brands and, and people changing the conversation of kind of bringing plant-based to the forefront. I mean, 10 years ago, for sub 5% of the population in the UK bought plant-based food products in the supermarket. And now it's about 48%. So there's been this kind of crazy trajectory. So there was also, there was white space, you know, there just mm. wasn't, you know, what we're making or, you know, what you're making that just didn't exist on the shelf mm. at this point. So again, it comes back to opportunity, doesn't it? And I that happy accident, right? Yeah. You, you know, into we, I started Instagram in 2000, late 2012. You started I, Instagram. I yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. Quite a big feat. Yeah, so the other effect. <laughs> the other effect. Um, I started our Instagram page. Yeah. End of 2012. Yeah, right, yeah probably around So there. when it was really in its kind of very early stages. Mm. So if you were looking for this sort of thing, it just, you know, there weren't, there wasn't really competition. Mm. Whereas now, if you wanted to create a brand like we've created, that would be incredibly difficult. It's a very saturated space. And then if you went to Waitrose or you went to Tesco's, you went to Sainsbury's and tried to sell them a similar product, well, that becomes really difficult as well because they've now got a whole plethora of mm. similar things on the shelf. And so it just comes back to, isn't it? It's like recognizing opportunity. But mm. I do think we're lucky now to be able to create brands in the way that loads of people do, you know, all those Instagram ads everyone gets mm. all day, every day. Mm you know, they cost a fraction of what it costs to get on TV. So there is this opportunity now to create small businesses, which I just don't think people were afforded in the same way 20 years ago, which no is ways. really exciting. It's really exciting. And, and also that's why there is, a, like you said, a huge amount of opportunity out there. It's just about finding those white spaces. I love that. Archaic places that haven't really been moved or shaped mm. or exactly. whatever in a while. I think that's so true. Um, and we've taken up quite a lot of your time. Um, your, your book that is out, where can we get it from? Amazon's always the easiest, isn't is it? Is Amazon the best place? Well, Amazon sell at half price, so. Hey, look at that. Don't get it from Amazon. Don't get it from yeah. Amazon. Go and buy it Get it from price. Sainsbury's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <exactly. laughs> Go and buy it from the most exactly. expensive place. <laughs> yeah. You can buy it. Um, and we can follow you on Instagram. You can follow me on Instagram. And we can check out your podcast. You can check out my podcast. Out of everything that you have done and created, what gives you the biggest fulfillment? It's that it is the sense of community. It is that, you know, we've, we've talked about this, it, it's hard running a business and owning a business and I think there is this sense of knowing why you do it and you it's hearing from people that it's had some kind of impact on them or it's like helping their kids eat more vegetables or it's you know they started using the app and they're meditating from it and that's really helping them get through a difficult week it's just little it doesn't have to be you know the big you've changed my whole life messages or those are although those are extraordinary it's just knowing that there's a worthwhile mm. element that's kind of I, I just don't feel that motivated by spreadsheets, probably because I can't read them. Same as me. But the, the numbers don't do it. It's, it's the people and knowing that it's, yes, meaningful in some capacity. 
I love that. Ella, thank you so much for no, being a guest. Thank you, guys. No, huge fan. Go and grab Ella's book as well. We'll leave everything in the description below. Ella, thank you so much. What we'd like to do at the end of the podcast is leave our listeners with something inspirational. Oh, my God. Harsh sorry. again. Yeah, Meme. sorry. Come on. Straight in. Well. It's the Ella effect. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You know <laughs> what? <laughs> Just disappears. <laughs> exactly. It doesn't have to answer yeah, the question. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to narrow it down, I think. You know, people obviously often ask, you know, I want to change my diet, I want to get healthier. And I think if I was going to say, if you're going to change one thing in your life, I think making sure that it's something that you actually enjoy. I think so often when we make try and make changes and we try and get healthier and feel better in ourselves, we make it from a really negative place of like, we're not good enough or I hate this about myself or I hate this habit. And actually trying to do it slowly in a sustainable way where you actually enjoy the habits you're putting in. Stop kind of criticizing yourself and saying you're doing it wrong you're not doing it wrong just do it slowly do it incrementally like think about decades not days and just make sure you enjoy it if you're just trying to emulate someone else and you hate it it will not last love that and thank you so much everybody will see you next week goodbye oh, this is a good